All right, this is SQL Server Security from the ground up. If you thought you were in the Bob Ward session, you're in the wrong place. Little housekeeping to begin with. If you would please silence your cell phones or anything else that's gonna make a lot of noise. If you have to take a phone call, I understand completely. Please do it out in the hall. Let's try and be respectful of each other. We are at Pass Summit. This is the first session on the first regular day of Pass Summit. So everybody has lots of energy, right? No one's gonna fall asleep, except maybe me. Um, this is a small piece of what Pass has to offer. Um, there are free online webinars. You've got local users groups. If you don't have a local users group near you, I don't. The closest one's I think an hour and a half away from me. But there are virtual groups. And they're by subject and they meet reasonable, reasonably often and they're a great material. Um, SQL Saturdays. If you like conferences, go to a SQL Saturday. They happen all over the world on obviously Saturdays. Um, and I, I honestly, I think they're running most weekends at this point. And I'm sure you can find one within a reasonable driving distance of you. Um, there is 24 hours of pass, pass marathon, et cetera, online training. Basically what I'm trying to say is if you are not a member of pass, it's free, which is my favorite thing. And it's really easy to do and they don't spam you with a lot of email. I can't recommend it enough. If you look around, okay, you will see people, you know, all these little things and you'll see people with a volunteer sticker and I can't remember what color it is. You'll see people out there with signs, they're volunteers. They are donating their time. They're extremely helpful. If you get a chance, say thank you, okay? They're a lot, of, large part of what makes this process run. Okay, a little bit about me, and very little bit about, bleh, can't talk today. A very little bit about me. I am a data platform MVP. I blog a lot. Um, I blog at sqlstudies.com, which is, well, do I have, eh, whatever. Um, I blog at sqlstudies.com. Feel free, come out, read a post, leave a comment. Glad to have you. If you want to get in touch with me, you can send me an email, sqlstudent at gmail.com. Um, I'm kind of iffy about my email at times, so not the best way to get in touch with me. Probably the best way is on Twitter. I am at SQLstudent144. Um, that's actually how my family gets a hold of me, so you're probably going to notice there's a bit of a theme, right? I give homework. There will be a quiz. If you've ever been in one of my sessions, no, I'm not kidding. Okay, this is the first session on the data security learning pathway. This is something new that they're trying this year. I'm really proud to be part of it. Um, after this, uh, later today, Brian Kelly will be doing how I would attack SQL Server. And then Ed Light and Dick will be doing a couple of sessions on Thursday and Friday, also about security. This is a good way to get a nice grounding on security. Um, the keynote tomorrow is also on security, so you can tell that we do put a lot of emphasis on the subject. All right, so getting started. Would everybody in the room please raise your hand? Rob, raise both. Okay, who here, whoop, wrong way. Who here is responsible for security? Every single one of us. Okay, yes, you can put your arms down. I don't care if you are the CEO, the CIO, manager, a developer, a DBA, or the person who takes the trash out in the evening. We are all responsible in some way, shape, or form for one of our company's most valuable assets, its data. So this session, I am going to assume you know absolutely nothing about how SQL Server security works. By the end of this session, you will be able to manage the security on a SQL Server instance. 
okay? And we're gonna do that, we're gonna start with definitions. I like starting with definitions, I like words in general. The problem with words is if we're not using the same words and we don't mean the same thing when we say them, it's very easy to get confused, you're liable to get into arguments, mistakes happen, it's not a good thing. So we're all gonna get on a nice level playing field before we move on. Then we're gonna hit the GUI, Management Studio. Just talking about Management Studio. We are very lucky to have it, okay? SQL Server Management Studio is an awesome tool. I've been using it for a long time, and I can promise you it's better than most tools out there. Security, on the other hand, is not as intuitive as it could be within the tool. So I'm gonna go over where in the GUI you're gonna find the different types of security. Last but not least, everybody's favorite, we're gonna hit best practices. Best practices are guidelines that some very smart people have spent a lot of time and effort coming up with what works best for most people most of the time. That most is very important, okay? I'm a firm believer that if you do not know, sorry, starting my timer here. If you do not know why a best practice is a best practice, then you do not know when you shouldn't be using it because every best practice has its exceptions. Max, uh, max stop, max degree of parallelism should never be one except when it should. And if you know why it should never be one, then you know what the exceptions are. So we're gonna start with definitions. We've got principles, we've got securables, and we've got permissions. I like to start right in at the bottom with permissions. Permissions are what do you want to be able to do? I'd like to come into your house, may I? A user would write to, like to run a select on a table, can they? Every object within SQL Server has its own set of permissions, and sometimes they are the same, sometimes they aren't. There are a whole lot of permissions available within SQL Server. There's absolutely no reason or need for you to memorize them all, okay? That's what documentation is for. No one I know, with one or two possible exceptions, knows all of them. And even them, the only reason they know them is because they've been using it for so long. That said, I've got a handful of them up here. I'm gonna go through them, what they do, how they're named, and give you guys a feel for how this works, okay? So to start with, tables and views, there's an insert permission. And it lets you run an insert statement. There are also select, update, and delete permissions that not surprisingly let you run select, update, and delete statements. You can actually run insert, update, and delete against a view with certain requirements on the view. And you can go and look in the books online for that, but just be aware that it can be done. Store procedures and functions, you can execute them. This next one's a little bit more confusing. Store procedures, functions, and views have a permission called view definition. This lets you see the code. For any T-SQL based code object, this will let you see the code behind it. With the exception of encrypted store procedures, extended store procedures, and CLR, you can see the code behind a view, a store procedure, or function. That includes system stuff, by the way. So if you wanna look at how SP Help works, then if you have view definition, then you can see how exactly the code behind SP Help. Databases, you have a connect permission. At the instance level, this is called connect SQL, but it's basically the same permission. This lets you connect to the database change your database context. That is all it does. I can step in the door, I can't look at anything, I can't touch anything, I can't go anywhere. All I can do is step in that door. I can't see anything. If you can do anything else, it is because you've got additional permissions. And to those who are standing up, there's plenty more seats, if you want. Um, backup lets you run a backup. 
All right, does anybody want to let me know what you can do if you have the create procedure permission? And I will warn you in advance, this is a trick question. Anybody? With no, I'm just create procedure. Yes. Nope. Uh, and that's why it's a trick question. And if you want to come up, I got a, a goodie for you. Um, with create procedure, the ability. From what? Actually, with the, the create procedure permission on its own, you can do absolutely nothing. Um, it is one of a handful of permissions where you have to have, or a handful of tasks where you have to have more than one permission to be able to do anything. Okay? And, and if you think about it a little bit, there's a good reason. Okay? So all store procedures are a member of a schema, right? They're contained within a schema. So I create my procedure, but I don't have a place to put it unless I have alter on a schema, which means it fails. So you have to have both permissions. You have to be able to alter a schema, and you have to have the create permission. This is the same with create table, create function, et cetera. And I'll, warn, I'll tell you, it took me a lot of time to figure this out, years. Um, but just be aware that some tasks require more than one permission to do them. View database state, um, and there's a view server state, give you access to DMVs, database management views, and database management functions that tell you about the database state or the server state. Now, here's your first, first piece of homework. When you get a chance, download the PowerPoint, it's already on the past site and you see that little picture there at the bottom? That is a link to a poster. I want you to follow the link. Look at the poster, you don't have to print it out or anything. But it is a fantastic reference tool. It has all the permissions within SQL Server. And it is maintained by Microsoft, so it's generally kept up to date. Securables. What do we want permission to? I want to come in the house. The house is the securable. The user wants to select from a table. The table is the securable. And within SQL Server, a lot of securables are also containers. And they contain other securables. So for example, a database is a securable. We can grant permissions to it. It is also a container. It has schemas in it. Schemas, whoop, wrong way are securables, they are containers, they contain tables and store procedures and functions and views and so on. Tables, believe it or not, are also containers. They contain columns. And you can, in fact, do column level security. And in the almost 30 years now I've been doing this, I've never once used column level security. There is a much easier way to do it and I will try to remember to explain that later. If I forget, feel free to point that out. Sorry, the reason I bring up containers is because when you grant a permission to a container, to a database, to a schema, you are effectively granting that permission to every object within that container. So if I grant select at the database level, I have granted the select permission to, well, effectively granted the select permission to every object that has the select permission within that database. If I grant execute at the schema level, then it is effectively granted to every store procedure and function within that schema. Okay, and that's an important thing to remember. Instances are also containers. They contain databases. They have their own permissions. They are securables. The permissions at the instance level do not get inherited by the objects within them in the same way, or at least not that I've found. You do have like the backup permission that does affect the databases, but you don't have like a select permission. Uh, there's view any definition, there's connect any database. Those are pretty explicitly about the databases within the server, within the instance. But in general, instance level permissions affect the instance, database level and lower connect data, affect a database and lower. 
Okay, principles. Who wants permission? I want to come in the house. I am the principal. User wants to run a select on a table. The user is the principal. There are a lot of principles within SQL Server, and they all break down into two categories. Server and database level principles. Frequently known as logins and users. Now, quick rant. I do not like the term logins and users. They are the correct terms. The commands are create login, create user. Those are the correct terms. I hate them. They are too overloaded. Remember what I said about language earlier? I am a user, and in spite of what I said a minute ago, I am not a database principal. I have a login that is sometimes called a user that connects to my network in the morning that has nothing to do with databases. I have users that I do work for that are also not database principals. My recommendation to you is say login, say user, think principal. Think server principal, think database principal. It will help. If nothing else, it'll help you ask questions. Because if someone comes up to you and says, I have a user that needs permissions to this database, you can ask, do you mean a person? Or do you already have a database principal that needs additional permissions? I need a user for the instance. Well, that's obviously got all kinds of problems. And it will let you ask the right questions. All right, different types of logins and users. We have SQL authenticated logins and users, Active Directory and Windows authenticated logins and users, Active Directory and Windows groups at the server and database level. We have logins and users mapped to certificates and asymmetric keys. We also have roles at the server and database level that are not logins or users, but are still principles. So what are roles? Roles are containers. Okay, they contain other principles. You grant them permissions, you add members, those members now share those permissions. There are two types of roles. There are built-in roles. These are the ones that are installed with the product. Okay, at the server level you have things like sysadmin, bulk admin, security admin, and so on. At the database level, you'll see DB data reader, DB deny data reader, okay, things like that. They are installed when you install, or they're created when you install SQL Server. These are also fixed. You cannot change the permissions on these roles. If you try, you'll get an error. And that's kind of a good thing. Um, DB data reader always means I can, you can read from anything within that database. You cannot change it. That said, there are a handful of roles that are built-in roles that you can change. Anybody want to guess where they are? Anybody know where they are and want to just tell me? Come on, Rob, you know. Yeah, fair enough. All right, MSDB. And in fact, if you need to grant permissions to someone and it's for something odd and you're not sure where to find it, there's a decent chance it's going to be an MSDB. There, this is where you will find permissions to SQL Agent, to SSIS packages, to CLR, and so on. Um, these are just roles that are part of MSDB. That said, they are not fixed. You can change the permissions on them. Now, let me tell you what's going to happen if you change these permissions. The SQL gods, in their instance on high, are going to mark you for punishment. So imagine that you, your security team says you need to run this hardening script in production, and you do. A few years later, you're part of a big project, right? Um, <clears throat> you've tested it in development, in test, model office work beautifully, so you schedule your upgrade. There's a dozen people who've come into the office on Saturday. Everything's going smoothly until you start testing, and one of these roles, you're not, it's not working. You're not getting the permissions you need. And so you're scrambling, panicky for a few hours, trying to figure out what on earth is going wrong. 
how can I work around this? And in the end, there's that final go, no go meeting and it's a no, you can't get it to work. So everybody rolls all this work back and that whole weekend is a complete loss. So for the next couple of weeks, you struggle to figure out what on earth happened because it works in all the other environments. It works on this server over here, but not over here, why? And finally someone says, what was that hardening script that we ran a couple of years ago? What did that do? Oh yeah, that changed the permissions, didn't it? And I cannot tell you how many permissions are involved in these roles and how hard it is to fix them when they get messed up. Okay, they are a real pain in the neck to fix. So just don't, okay? Just because you can doesn't mean you should. Never touch these roles. All right, so we have built-in roles. We have some that are fixed and we can't touch them. We have some that are not fixed and please don't. So what do we do? We use the user-defined roles. These are the ones we create ourselves, we grant the permissions to, we add members to, and we move along happily. Now, the neat thing about these is they are principles. They are also containers of principles. They stack. I can create a user role, yet another use of the word user, and an admin role. Okay, the user role has permissions for everything needed to take a call at a call center. The admin role has permissions to manage the users and is a member of the user's role, so they have all the permissions needed to take a call as well. Now, it's an active application, permissions change. If I change what's required to take a call, I change it in the one role and everybody who's a member of that role, including the admin role, now has those permission changes. If I need to change something with the admins, I change it in the admins and the users are unaffected. Now, another piece of homework, poster. Actually, this is two posters, one for server, one for database. Fair warning, the link is old um, and it will come up saying this is an old link, don't use this anymore but it's the only link I could find that actually took you to both of the posters. Um, but again, they are fabulous tools for research, for reference. Take a look at them, get a feel for them. Um, this way, when you need the information, you know where to go. All right, so tying all this together. To start with, everybody knows that SQL Server is a relational database management system, right? Keyword relational. We use tables and views and things like that. All right, so that first column, those three views are your server level permissions. That's all of it. Second three are your database level permissions. This is everything we've talked about so far. And another piece of homework, I want you to go home and take a look at them. Okay, run some queries, review the information. This is gonna reinforce everything we've talked about so far. <clears throat> they are tied together, okay? So the server ones are tied together and the database ones are tied together. This is not all the security information there is. All right, there's a lot of other views and store procedures and functions and stuff that have some really cool information in them. Every time I give this session, I like to just pick one at random. And I don't put it in my notes, so if you don't write it down, you won't know what it is. sys.fn underscore my underscore permissions. Take a look at it, try it out, see if you can figure out how to use it, read books online. See if you can figure out how to use it for, to look at somebody else's permissions. This was really, really useful. Um, if you run into problems, feel free to call me. FN underscore my underscore permissions. Huh? 
And it is obviously a function, starts with FN. Um, if you have any great successes, you know, I'd like to hear those too. That's always fun. Um, and you may have figured something out that I don't know. It is a distinct possibility. Lord knows I'm still learning too. All right. So I said the instance ones are tied together and the database ones are tied together, right? Well, the instance and database level principles are also tied together. Hopefully that's fairly obvious to everybody, or at least that they should be. So how are they tied together? And if you look at these two system views, you're gonna see three columns that are likely possibilities. First one is the principal ID. And this is in fact how the instance and the database level are tied to within the, themselves. Best I can tell, it's just an identity column. So if you add a new server principal, you get a new principal ID there. If you add a new database principal, you'll get a new principal ID there. They don't necessarily match. Name. If you have ever done any database design, you should be aware that name is possibly the worst way to tie two tables together. Okay, if you haven't, just be aware, name is possibly one of the worst ways to tie two tables together. I have lost, I can't tell you how many hours, searching for a user based on the login name and not finding it, and completely unable to figure out why. And it's because they don't have to have the same name. Okay, I can name my server principal Bob and my database principal George, and it will work just fine. Be confusing as heck, but it will work. And, and what I'll see a lot of times is with domain users, with Active Directory users, you have domain and then username. And for whatever reason at the database level, they'll strip off the domain because they can. Don't do that. It's confusing, especially if you're, for whatever reason, your application requires you to have both a user ID, uh, you know, SQL Server authenticated ID and an Active Directory authenticated ID. And so you've got domain slash name and name, and boy, that can get confusing. So it isn't name either, which leaves the SID, the SID, which is a var binary. And if you play with these enough, you will start to realize that the length of the var binary will tell you where it came from. SQL authenticated, obviously created by SQL Server. Active Directory logins and groups, or Windows logins and groups, created by Active Directory or Windows. And the certificates, it's actually a hash of the asymmetric key, which I personally found very interesting. Now, sometimes the SIDs don't match and you get what's called an orphan. And if you are a DBA and you've been doing it for a little while, you have probably encountered orphans, right? User comes to you and says, I can't log in. Something's wrong. And if you're a user, a database user, there's a good chance that you've encountered orphans and gone to your DBA and said, I can't log in, something's wrong. And it, it happens, okay, it, it, it's almost guaranteed. And the most common time it happens is when you're asked to copy a database from one server to another. All right, so I copy my database over, and you'll notice something's missing, right? We get a problem, there's no login. So let's create the login. And all of a sudden, we're good. Whoop, pushed a button. Whoop, went wrong direction. There we go, okay. and. You use that using the create login func command or through the GUI. But what if it's SQL authenticated? Now, we copy that database over. Oops, we have orphans. We create the login. But wait, we still have orphans. There's a problem still, right? Now, the easy way to fix that is to change the SID within the database. Okay, and you do that by using SP change users login in older systems or with alter user in newer systems. And that changes the SID in the database, and you're done. Until a couple of months roll by, 
and the developers say, hey, would you copy that database again? We need you to refresh it. And you do it, and you tell them you're done, and about 20 minutes later they say, um, it's broken. Did you actually do it? Because we can't log in. And you're like, oh, darn it, I forgot. Let me fix that for you. And you fix it. And that's great, we're done, we're fixed, right? Until a couple more months roll by, and they ask again. Now, so you, you know, you fix it. Whoop, wrong way to fix it. No, nope, that's right, okay. Um, so here's the thing. After three, four, five times where, you know, they keep coming back to you and they start adding it into the request, they say, you know, would you go ahead and create the database and please remember to fix the login, you know, fix the orphans, and you're still forgetting, and they're gonna start wondering if you really know what you're doing. I speak from experience. I'm a very forgetful person. So let's fix it once, okay? Let's fix it the right way. It's not necessarily the easy way, but let's fix it the right way. So we copy our database over. This time, when we create the login, we can specify the SID, all right? You cannot do this with the GUI. I'm a big fan of the GUI. I think if you are new to working with databases, the GUI is essential. That said, you need to learn how to code because there's a lot of things you just can't do in the GUI. This is one of them. And in fact, while you're at it, if you get the hash of the password, you can pass the hash of the password along and you never need to know the password when you're creating the new login. If this looks intimidating, it's really not so bad and there's a lot of scripts out there that'll help you with it. Um, Microsoft has one called SP Help Rev Login. Um, I've got one on my website called um, sys. or sp.srv permissions. Uh, the late great Robert Davis had one on his blog. They're all over the place. Okay, they're not hard to find. Again, if you run into problems, you know, feel free to contact me on Twitter or whatever. Um, or on Twitter, there's SP Help or SP Help. There's SQL Help hashtag. It's a great place to get help, um, and we'll get you through it, okay? It, it's really, again, it looks intimidating, but it's not. Okay, as with everything, there are exceptions. Anybody wanna try and guess what the exceptions are for SIDs not matching and it being an orphan? Oh, go ahead. No, because this is a var binary, and so there's no case sensitivity involved. What? Oh, um, that's actually the same problem, that you do get orphans. When you have, he was asking about availability groups. When you have an availability group, okay, so you're, you're essentially copying a database from one server to another, you still have to go ahead and create the server principles on your secondary Otherwise, when you fail over, you're not gonna be able to log in, okay? And that's a really common thing that happens to people with availability groups. Um, no, because sysadmin doesn't, you don't have a database principle, so. Contain databases is one. The other one is roles. Roles do not and cannot have the same SID. Well, they could have the same SID, but it wouldn't matter in the slightest because server and database level roles have absolutely nothing to do with each other. I kind of wish you could create a server role and put database permissions within it, but you're not allowed. The other is, as this gentleman mentioned, contain databases. This was Microsoft's solution to the orphan problem, SQL IDs. And essentially what happens is the login information, there, there's not actually a sys.server principles table that, you, that is exposed to us within the database, but the password and all that information is actually contained within the database. And when you copy the database, it all goes with it. That said, you are con within a database. You can't do cross database calls at that point. Yes, yes. Idera has a tool that'll do it as well. 
Um, I'm going to make a wild guess, and because I'm not 100% certain, and guess that Redgate and Century One and, and any number of others also have tools. DBA tools also like yes, and and DBA tools uh, power. If you if you're using PowerShell with SQL Server, you could do a lot worse than taking some sessions on DBA tools. They are very very useful and very very well written. And again, they will also copy your logins over correctly. All right, <clears throat> so how do we apply a permission? We can grant it, okay? That applies a positive permission. Okay, I can walk in the house. The user can select from the table. You can deny. Deny applies a negative permission. I can't walk in the house. The user can't select from the table, okay? It does apply a permission. If you go back to the earlier views and you look when you run, run a deny, you will see a row added that says this is a deny. Grant and denies are opposites, obviously, but they are both permissions. They both apply permissions. Revoke is the opposite of the two of them. Revoke will remove a permission, whether or not it's a grant or, it is a grant or a deny. And again, if you go back and you look at those system views, if you run a grant, you'll see a grant row appear. If you run a deny, it will overwrite the grant, but it'll still be there. If you run a revoke, it'll remove it. Okay? Now, every time I have ever had this slide deck checked and I am terrible at spelling, I'm terrible at grammar, I get my slide decks checked thoroughly ahead of time, and every time it's ever been checked, I've always had it pointed out that deny is bigger than grant. And there's a reason, because deny trumps grant, okay? If there is a deny, you cannot do it, period. I don't care if you are granted the permission through 12 roles, 37 active directory groups, and at the database level. If there's a deny anywhere, you can't do it. It has actually gotten so bad at times that I will go back to the system view and run a quick query looking for any denies, and then I'll start tracking backwards from that deny to see if it applies in this case. And that will go faster than trying to look through all their permissions. Don't use denies unless you need to. Okay, it is far easier and far safer to just not grant someone permissions. Law of unintended consequences, right? Well, the problem I have found with that though is the public roles. Okay, so he is. Yeah, so he's he's saying that um, the public role, the public role is a role that everybody is a member of. And you run into a problem where if someone does insert, update, and delete within the public role, now everybody can do that, and you kind of feel like you have to deny people if you don't want them to do stuff. And the solution to that is never grant insert, update, and delete within the public role. Is it there by default? No, it's not. If you go look, if you create a brand new database um, on a new instance, because if you change something in model, it, the permissions in model are created along with every new database, um, but yeah, by default, no, public does not have insert, update, and delete. Um, it, gives you, it gives you select access to certain system views, but really by default, that's all it'll do, okay? So if you can avoid it, don't use denies, because again, law of unintended consequences, you're gonna end up with problems at some point. Okay. Yes? Okay, so the question was, is what's an example of deny? And the gentleman here was saying that they're, they've got a system where they use functions and store procedures and so on to actually change the data or to select the data. So they've created roles that grant execute on those. They're doing the work, but at the same time, they deny at least the direct access by users to those tables. Okay, administrative principles and permissions. 
if you are ever audited, these are the six that your auditor wants to know about. Well, realistically, most auditors I've ever met care about SA and sysadmin. If you are a DBA and you are going to an auditor, you need to give them all six. These are your God accounts. They can do anything, okay? SA and DBO are single individuals. They are single principles, okay? Believe it or not, DBO is singular. There can be only one of them. They own the database. Under roles, you have sysadmin and DB owner. And then you also have the control permission or the control server and control database permissions. These are all very, very similar. Okay, I think the main difference between control server and sysadmin is control server cannot put people in the sysadmin role. Okay? <clears throat> so you want to keep an eye on these people. Okay, the, the, the question is, is the difference between the DBO schema and the DBO owner of the database? And it's very simple. One is a schema, one is a principle. And, and while they're named the same, names are a terrible, horrible way to relate to things. Um, the DBO schema is honestly a relic. Um, it is the default owner of all objects within the database, or most objects within the database. It really doesn't have anything to do specifically with the database owner, other than by default it is owned by the da database owner. And that will affect its permissions. But that goes a little bit beyond the scope of this session. So, <clears throat> you see the, the red line there? Okay, the stuff to the left of that red line ignores denies. That is, they are the exception to the deny rule. If you are sysadmin, SA, or the DBO, then denies do not affect you. And in fact, as far as I know, the system doesn't even bother checking um, to see whether you have permissions or not. It just lets you do it. And if that scares anybody, it should. The only people who are sysadmin are, like, should be DBAs you know, who have to be for, to do their jobs. Nobody else should be sysadmin if you can at all help it. There are bits of code within SQL Server that require you to have sysadmin. Um, the replication store procedures, for example, actually have the word sysadmin. You know, you must be a member of the sysadmin role to, in order to run this store procedure built within them. Hopefully that will change at some point. But again, these guys are the ones you need to keep a close eye on. Okay, so demo time. And for some reason, oops, I have two copies of Manager Studio open. So let's fix that. Okay, so when working with the GUI, the important thing just to remember, whether you were looking at a principal or a securable. Okay, so for example, the server is a securable. If I right click on it and I go to permission or go to properties, there is going to be a permissions tab. There's also a security tab, but that's not really what this session is. It's not part of this session. Mainly what I want you to concentrate is on the permissions tab. Okay? And this is where you're going to see a list of all the server principles and what permissions each of them has. So if I come down here, let's see if the Cowardly Lion has any permissions. Yes. He can connect to SQL. And it's kind of looking like that's all he can do. How about Dorothy Gale? Now, rather than scroll through the whole thing, I'm going to hit effective. And this tells me what are my effective permissions? What do I actually have? All right, so Dorothy Gale has administer bulk operations, connect SQL, and view any database. 
And I can come back over here and I can see that if I wanted to scroll down. Oop, there we go, bulk operations. And they must have viewed any database probably through another, another, another method. Blech, can't talk today. Okay, so we'll go to databases. Again, a database is a securable. So we right click on it, we go to properties, and the permissions tab, which of course has to be in a different place to make things easy. <clears throat> and you will see a list. Now, interestingly enough, this list only includes those database principles that have a permission. Okay, so if you create a database principle and it doesn't have a permission, it won't show up in this list. The way you'd add it is you would hit search and browse and there's the complete list. So for example, I can hit guest and hit okay and okay and add it to the list. Okay, guest in case you're interested is kind of like public. Um, it's your set of permissions when you don't have any other set of permissions. Another one of those that I don't think you should ever touch. And in fact, the best practice is to disable guest. So again, we're gonna look at Dorothy Gale and we can see what permissions she has. Okay, she has connect and she has execute. Now, what you may be wondering is, what is this with grant? Oh, and if you wanted to deny someone something, I could deny insert by checking that. And you may be wondering what this with grant does. So if I check this, you'll notice grant appears as well. With grant says that this person can now grant permissions to this object, can grant this permission to this object. Okay, so if I want Dorothy Gale to be able to grant select permissions at the database level, that's how I would do it. Now, because I am SQL student, and learning is one of my favorite things, and I told you you needed to know how to script, see the script button here? You will see it on most pages within Management Studio, and if you hit the script button, let me close this, that, those are the scripted changes. Okay, and one of the ways I like to learn how to do something new is I do it in the GUI, and then I hit script, and then I read the script. Okay, so <clears throat> that's the securables. Now let's look at a principle. If I go into the server level security, see, we've got our principles right here. So we're gonna take a look at the logins and with a principle, I can actually double click on it or I can right click and hit properties. And here's the server level permissions for the Cowardly Lion. On the general page, you've got their password, you've got whether they, you enforce a password policy, which you should, but I don't on my laptop. Um, you know, if they're a Windows authenticated ID, whatever. What server roles are they a member of? This table here is kind of interesting. If you have a decent sized server, this particular tab will take forever to come up, okay? I don't like this tab, I don't use it because it really does take forever to come up. That and it's a little bit misleading, okay? So Dorothy Gale has access to the emoji data, or sorry, the Cowardly Lion has access to the emoji database and the lions and tigers and bears on my database, and their username is the Cowardly Lion. And then you can see what roles they belong to for each database. If I click on one, I can add them, and I can grant the permissions and move on. But here's the trick. That checkbox right here, this one right here, only tells you, it only comes checked if they have the connect permission. I have had cases where the database principle exists, but they don't have connect permissions, so they don't show up as checked here, so you hit the checkbox, and you hit okay, and you get an error saying the principle already exists. It's a bug in the code.
All right. Now, if I want to look at server level roles, let's see who's the sysadmin on here. Again, I can double click on it. So these are my sysadmins. And that's all you get here because it's a fixed role or a fixed role. You can't make any changes to the permissions, so all you get is a list of members. Now, let's go to the database level, and I want to bring back up my database permissions real quick because I want to point something out. And we're going to take a look at our database level principle. Again, Dorothy Gale. OK, so <clears throat> Dorothy Gale doesn't have any individual permissions listed here at all. And yet, we know she has some permissions, right? In fact, if we go over back to this other one here and look at permissions and Dorothy Gale and effective, she's got execute, right? And it doesn't show up over here because at the database level, OK, or sorry, at the database principal level, all you are looking at is their direct permissions at the database level, at, at below the database level, OK? So objects within the database. So if I want to grant Dorothy permission to something, again, I can do a quick search. Uh, you know what? Hit specific objects, this will just give me everything. Well, types of objects. We're going to look at tables, and we're going to hit browse, and eh, the Emerald Palace. OK. Hit OK. All right. So now we have our explicit tab populated. I can hit Alter on the table. I can also go over to Effective, and you'll notice they've got select permissions already even though I didn't grant it to them. That's because, again, back over here, she's got select permissions at the database level. And you'll remember how I told you that, where's select? There it is. Eh, it's not there either. It must be at the, a higher level than that. Or through a role. Probably a role. Do what? What do you mean? I, I could have done that. I know I didn't because I didn't do any schema level permissions in this. My guess is she's got it because she's a member of a role, and we'll go look at that in just a sec. Okay? That, he was asking if it was a, a schema level permission, and it is entirely possible that could be why. But I happen to know that I didn't do any schema level permissions, so it's not in this particular case. Um, my guess is that if I go over here to membership, She's a member of DB Data Reader. So she has select permissions through the role DB Data Reader. You can see why I said that the GUI is a little bit complicated to find permissions, right? It is still the best place to start. Um, you can write queries based on, on those system views is a lot easier. Um, I've also on my blog got SPSRV permissions and SPDB permissions that I personally think are a lot easier but they're also outside of the scope of this session. So, but again, you can see if you go through, you've got your securable list and your role list, or sorry, schemas, there you go. Membership list, which is your list of role memberships, that's how you would tell that. You also have to go, again, look at the server level and take a look there. You might have to go look at what schemas have permissions, and so on and so forth, OK? Clear as mud, right? OK, any, any questions on the GUI before I move on? Because again, I know the, I have senior DBAs come up to me on a regular basis asking for help with the GUI when it comes to permissions. So if you have problems, if you have questions, don't feel bad. Everybody does. All right, I'm hoping what I just showed you helps a little bit, but it isn't easy. All right, best practices. This is the part everybody likes, right? Everybody loves best practices, I hope. 
All right, so I've got my best practices bro broken down into three categories, least maintenance, least surface area, least privileges. Really least is probably your security best practice. But least maintenance, <clears throat> our lives are hard enough as it is. We have a lot of work to do. Let's not make it any more difficult than we absolutely have to. Don't make your permissions any more granular than you need to, okay? If you can grant something at a schema level, do that. If you can grant something at a database level, even better. If I grant select permission at the database level, then I don't care if you add new tables. All right, you are, they already have permissions. Use roles and Active Directory and Windows groups, assuming you're using Active Directory or Windows, okay? One of the best systems I've ever seen used them both together. They had roles based on what you, your job, what your task was, okay? So you had a role that was specifically to be able to take a phone call, to be able ad to administer people who take phone calls, um, to create this particular type of accounting task, okay? They were task-based. The permissions were available for a given task. Active Director and Windows Groups were created based on job role, okay? I am a senior accountant. I'm a junior accountant. Two different Active Directory groups, okay? Now, the nice thing about this is when someone changed positions within the company or left the company or was hired on, they were put in the appropriate role for their job. Now, within SQL Server, we added those roles, those Active Directory groups, and we put them within the roles of the tasks needed for that job. Okay, so now when those tasks change, when the permissions for the tasks change, you know, to be able to take a call, there's a whole new table. So we add a new table. Great. All right, we're done. Somebody move, is hired in and they get added to the call center role or call center active directory group, sorry. Then they have the permissions they need. Someone gets promoted from junior accountant to senior accountant, they've got the permissions they need. Okay? And you can see how tying these things together can make your life a lot easier. Be consistent. This isn't really anything to do with databases. This is a life thing. But let's say you've got 1,000 servers and you've got a new hire. And you're training them, right? So you say, OK, with this server, we did security this way. This server, we did it this way. This server, we did it this way. This server, we did it this way. This server, we did it. OK, you're going to be training them for the next six weeks on security, and they're not going to get it. If you can say, this is how we do security, here's the list of exceptions in this table over here. Go look at it if you need to. Then five minutes, and you're done. OK? The more consistent you can be, the happier you will be long run, especially when you start scaling out at an enterprise level. Least surface area. Here's the thing about security. Security is there for two purposes to protect you from mistakes and because they're out to get you. Remember, it is only paranoia if they're not actually out to get you, and they are. <clears throat> if you don't need it on the server, don't put it on the server, okay? I've heard people say, well, install SSIS, install SSIS, and just disable them, fine, as long as you've got a good way to, dis you know, you can ensure they're disabled. All right, don't put applications on your SQL Server. They are a security risk. Any avenue for someone to come in to your server is a security risk. SQL Server only. SSIS, just a quick example. SSIS is on my server. Cool, I can use it. I create a really complicated SSIS package, and I run it, and I just brought production down. Sorry, it was there, right? It was an accident, but production's still down. Okay, don't put databases on your servers that don't need to be there. 
You see a theme here, right? Just as a quick example, let's say you've got, you were in a lawsuit a few years back, okay? Legal has said you have to keep this database for seven years, but no one touches it anymore. It's not needed anymore. Other than for legal purposes, it has to exist for seven years. It doesn't have to be on the server, okay? Back it up, put the backup in a secure location, preferably encrypted, and get it off your server. Because when your server gets hacked, and note I say when, if you find out, then that legal database is now active again, you're storing it for another seven years, and potentially you just opened up a whole new can of worms. And that just made your bad news of being hacked a whole lot worse, if it could be worse. So don't put them on there if they don't need to be there, okay? I, I include things like AdventureWorks. It never needs to be on a shared server. AdventureWorks or Wide World Importers or any of those things are meant for you to play with on, on a workstation or a machine of your own. Or if it's gonna be a shared machine, it's gonna be like a classroom type machine. All right, they don't need to be taking up space. And again, let's say someone accidentally does a full join instead of a cross join and just inserted a billion rows into this table. And it happened to be the table where tempdb is stored or the, you know, the, the directory where tempdb is stored and, or the drive, sorry, your server crashes. It was an accident, right? Happens. Disable SQL Server protocols you're not using. There are really only three of them. Um, TCP IP, name pipes, and shared memory. Shared memory is for access when you are on that server. If you're not aware, the best practice is never log into the server. Disable shared memory, okay? It makes it that much harder for someone to get into your SQL Server if they happen to get into your server. Chances are if they got into your server, they're gonna get there anyway, but let's make it harder on them. TCP IP and name pipes are remote access. I have actually seen machines where the only access to the SQL server is if you remote into the server. It was a highly secure server. <clears throat> it had no access to the internet. The only time you were supposed to get that data was by logging in directly to the machine. And that's great until Bob over on the network team sees, hey, that server's not on the network, adds it. And now you've got this nice and exposed machine of highly secured data, right? But if you had disabled TCP IP and name pipes, again, it's that much harder for someone to get to it. Make yourself as small a target as possible. Least privilege. Everybody's heard least privilege, right? This is what you'll see in every security book, right? Everybody's heard of least privilege, I hope. Okay, if they don't need to be able to do it, they shouldn't be able to do it. Who in here is a developer? And I'm gonna be, I'm, I'm gonna freely admit I am a developer at heart. Okay, you don't need DBO. You don't need DBO even in a development environment. It's just not necessary. And when someone comes to me and says, I need DBO, my initial response is, why do you need to be able to drop the database in such a way that is completely unrecoverable? And if you can tell me why, then we'll talk farther. DBO, database owner, DB owner, is completely unnecessary with very, very few exceptions. The only time I've ever heard of it really being useful is if you have junior DBAs that you want to have access to the database, but not access to the server. Or if you have like two companies sharing a server, one supports the server, the other has some databases on there, they might have DB owner. <clears throat> Grant your permissions to views and store procedures instead of the underlying tables. Now, this is a development choice. This is what the other gentleman was talking about. Um, this is what Microsoft does, okay? If you go look at, at the system views, 
Notice I say they're views, right? They're not tables. We actually do not have access to the system tables, except under very specific circumstances. Um, we have store procedures, we have views, we have functions that give us access to change things, but no access to the underlying tables. And that can be very useful because if you need to change something, you're just changing code. If you need to change a table, how a table looks, then you can change the code on top of it and no one will ever know the difference. Okay, so again, it's kind of a development choice. If you choose to go that route, it works really well. If you choose to just grant permissions at the table level and everything else, well, you know, that works too. Okay, last but not least, grant your permissions at the lowest level you possibly can, okay? Grant your permissions at the table level, at the store procedure level. Only grant to a schema if you absolutely have to, and granting at the database level should be your very last resort, okay? Does that make sense to everybody? Wait, so you're saying that this line on the bottom here is exactly the opposite of that line on the top? Yeah. All right, when, when we're done, come up here. I got something for you. And, I, and, and, and you just happen to be the first one to get it. And thank you, because sometimes nobody gets it. OK, you are absolutely right. I delib did that deliberately. Because security is give and take. It is a balancing act. It is actually a juggling act. Because lease maintenance, lease permissions, lease surface area are frequently at odds. Making our lives as easy as possible would be to give everyone sysadmin and walk away. But obviously, we can't do that. What do you do about uh, people staging? Um, developers always want to be able to run jobs or audiences, create jobs, modify jobs. G give me, let, me, let me finish this bit, and I'll talk about that in just a second. It's actually not part of my thing, but I'll, I'll add it because I've got a few extra minutes. Um, <clears throat> but here's the thing. We have a couple of jobs as security people within SQL Server, okay? We have to protect our data, right? We need it to be as secure as possible so we don't give anybody any access at all, right? But that doesn't work either because our other job is to make sure that our users and our developers can do their job. So it's a balancing act. If I've got a 1,000 servers, then I'm giving my permissions at the database layer as much as possible because I can't manage it at the object level. If I've got one server and one database, then I'm giving all my permissions at the object level because I can. You've got to basically, again, you've got to juggle. And like I said, be consistent. Pick a direction, OK? Do your best. Pick a direction. Go with it. Because here's the thing, they are out to get your data, okay? They're, they're, if you can look at the news, they're out to get it. I mean, there's breaches, bigger and more breaches all the time. And if we aren't doing our job, and the server team isn't doing their job, and the network team isn't doing their job, and we aren't all paying attention at the physical level and to social engineering, they're gonna get your data. It's a cooperative task. We all have to work together, do our best, and keep your fingers crossed, OK? Now, you were asking about um, agent. SQL agent, the security for SQL agent is less than optimal. And, and that's the best I can say about it. Um, I like to keep my stuff PG, so I can't use a lot of words I'd like to. <clears throat> Um, I was actually talking to somebody about this last night. You really only have two options. Okay, in case you aren't aware, the, a job can only be owned by an individual, and only, and except at very high levels of permission, only an individual can edit a job that they don't own. So you get two options. Create a SQL Server ID and have a shared password, which is a terrible idea. Um, or you create a store procedure that says, if I'm a member of this group, then I can change the owner to me, 
then the store procedure changes the owner. And then they can also change it back to the service account that actually is supposed to run it, which is maybe not a terrible idea, but a royal pain in the neck. Those are the only two solutions I've come up with. Now, we're, we're basically out of time. So real quick, session evaluations, OK, you can do them online. They've got giveaways. I appreciate any, anything you have to say, good or bad. Thank you for showing up. And just because I promised, here's your quiz. <laughs> and more than happy to answer questions afterwards.